I'd like to share some uh, experience that I've had recently um, working with organizations who are working in the, in the trying to improve their software delivery and operations processes uh, to make their software more, more um, to make it more reliable and more effective. Um, and I've had some thoughts or some revelations, if you like, about the way in which we should go about choosing tools to help organizations do these kind of things. And we'll cover four sort of broad areas. There's really more areas that we should cover, but this, this is enough for now. Um, collaboration, learning, what I call singleton tools. I'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, and Conway's Law. Again, I'll explain that later too. I've been building and operating software systems for about 15 years. Um, but I've also got background in cybernetics and neuroscience, which gives me a, maybe a slightly unusual approach to thinking about uh, software uh, and what constitutes a system. And some of that might come out later in the talk. I uh, set up and run the London Continuous, Del Continuous Delivery Meetup Group, which I was pleased to see is, was the largest group listed on the early slides. <laughs> oh, but only, only for another couple of months, apparently. So we'll see on that one. And uh, we also organized Pipeline Conference in April this year, which was the first conference dedicated to continuous delivery in Europe. Uh, there was, of course, Flowcon in the US uh, a little bit earlier. And we will be running Pipeline Conference again in early 2015. Uh, I co-founded uh, a small consultancy called Skelton Thatcher. There's two of us, one called Skelton, one called Thatcher. Rob's just sat there. Uh, and we help organizations to adopt and sustain good engineering practices, of which you'd expect DevOps, continuous delivery, aspects of ITIL, this kind of thing. Uh, those are the sorts of things that we help organizations to, to come to terms with. And some of the recent, just a, a very brief kind of understanding of the sorts of clients that we've been working with recently um, in, across lots of different sectors. So it's not the kind of things, the kind of patterns that I've seen and that I'll share today are not specific to say just the finance sector. So tourism, betting, travel booking, Financial, sort of financial data. Anyway, healthcare. It's a kind of across the across the across the spectrum. Um, so I'm pretty confident that these are fairly common patterns that we're likely to see in lots of different organisations. And some of the common themes that these some of these organisations have uh, have had. Um, many of them have been had an online presence for quite a while since sort of the dot com ish era. So some of their software is now what about 14, 15 years old. Um, they're very successful. But actually, part of, part of the punishment for that success is that they now have a kind of probably a big monolithic application or a big database in the center, which is now preventing more rapid delivery. And they've realized that they need to adopt things like this DevOps thing or this continuous delivery thing, but they're not quite sure how. So that's the, I mention that because that's the context in which I, I want to share this, this, um, um, th these thoughts tonight. Uh, if you think about how a lot of people used to choose technology, they'd have a big tick list of features and they go tick, 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 tick. Yes, right, let's pay the money. And that's clearly not, well, as far as I'm concerned, that's very much not how we need to approach technology selection for continuous delivery in DevOps. We need to think about the team interactions. We need to think about collaboration. We need to think about using tools as catalysts for change, but not just focusing in on the, the pure capabilities of that tool as listed by the vendor. Who has read uh, more than half of this book, Continuous Delivery? <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Who's read any of it? Okay, right, fine. That's useful to know because that, that, that will change you an what I share. Say again. You weren't an author. You weren't an author. I wasn't an author. No, no, God, no. Um, one of the authors, Dave Farley, um, I was uh, at a dinner with him a few weeks ago, and he was, um, and he's, he, he's, he's, um, he has characterized this in some of the talks. In fact, there's a, there's a talk from Pipeline Conference, which you'll find on, online, where he, he goes into this in some detail. But he characterizes continuous delivery as a, as a scientific approach to delivering software systems. Because we're, we're, we're thinking about metrics. We're thinking about having a, a premise, which we then uh, test, or theory, which we then test. And we get empirical evidence back. And we, we, we introduce a whole lot of rigor into software delivery, which arguably wasn't really there before, even with sort of agile practices. Um, it's, it's definitely worthwhile hearing what Dave has got to say uh, in some of his talks. There's the, the four R's, rapid, reliable, repeatable, regular, changes. And if you bring all those four things together, then you'll probably have to do something like, like what Jez Humble and David Farley suggest in their book, Continuous Delivery. So 
So continuous delivery really is fairly easy to define in the sense that go and read the book. Pretty much everything there is, is going to be good for most organizations. There's a lot that it doesn't cover. It doesn't cover, it covers very little about the operational side of uh, kind of operating software systems. But it's very good about on the, on the kind of development side, the, de the delivery side, prior to it going into operations. Um, it turns out that if you print out the contents page from continuous delivery, the book, and you put it on the wall, that, acts, that ends up like a bit of a, a roadmap to uh, executing, to getting to a stage where you've done lots of good stuff. And we literally did that at one of the places I worked. And we scored ourselves. You can see there we were three out of 13 for release anti-patterns. So you, you get the idea. The, 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 the chapter titles and things are, are written in such a way that you can actually tick them off. That's just a, an idea. DevOps, of course, is a bit more difficult to define. And there's lots of stuff online recently. This is my definition. Highly effective daily collaboration between software developers and IT operations people to produce relevant working systems. I'm not going to explain it now because I'm going to write a blog post and post it like in the next day or two. Um, but I think from, from my experience, that captures quite a lot of the stuff that, that um, we need to think about. There's obviously more people than just developers and operations people, so that, there's some other job titles on there, but it'll do. For me, it's definitely not just automation. It's definitely not just build and release. It's not just infrastructure development. It's not certainly not just system administration. Um, but th so that's where I'm coming from when I talk about DevOps. Um, that might surprise some of you, but anyway. So we'll talk a little bit about collaboration first. Uh, first off, version control. Who is not using Git? Hands really high. Who's not using Git? What are you using instead? Shout. Oh, God. <laughs> OK, so anyone who's using TFS? Any using TFS? TFS now supports Git. So you swap that out for Git for, for the actual version control part, and then you can still use TFS for all the rest of it. But you, uh, this is the only tool recommendation I'm making tonight is move to Git unless you've got really, really good reason not to. Anyway, so uh, uh, a kind of Git log session looks a little bit like this. Don't worry about the detail. You're not supposed to see the detail. The point is it looks a mess, right? It, lo it looks pretty, pretty gnarly. And if you're, um, uh, if you're a... Let's say you're an IT service desk, sort of first line support person, and a developer comes along and says, well, the config's in here, look, bash, 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 git, log, blah, 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 no, uh, name only, graph, blah, blah. They'll be going, I have no idea what you're talking about. It, it's, it's a very unfriendly way of a developer working with an IT operations person to try and look at configuration. <coughs> However, if we start to use what still is Git in effect, but something more like so a web browser interface. So this is uh, a project on GitHub that I'm, I'm sort of interested in. Um, OK, it doesn't, doesn't look too interesting at this point. Now we've got some comments. We can see what, what developers or people using this particular repository have started to say. Oh, we can get an idea of why the change was made, the purpose behind that change. And then we can get an inline diff right in the browser. I can completely see that. As a first line su uh, kind of support desk person, I can now see, oh, red means Use is gone. Green is new stuff that's been added. Um, and I'm quite happy now to kind of approve that change or to say, yeah, let's go ahead with this deployment because I, it's so easy for me to, to, to deal with it. We're still using the same technology, if you like. It's still Git from, the, from, uh, from one level. But, the, but we've thought about the needs of the people who need to interact with this across the spectrum. And um, the result is if we use Git in this way, or version control in this kind of way. Obviously, you can use Subversion and, and, and other tools that have the same kind of interface. But the point is, we're thinking about the user experience, if you like, or the skills of the people who need to use this stuff. We can sit down and have a conversation between two people. Two people can literally sit down at the same desk and talk through this change here. Does that make sense? Um, so here's a, I want to talk about deployment pipelines. Um, does anyone, who's happy with the term deployment pipeline? Who, who's, who's comfortable with what that means? About more than half. Okay, cool. Um, so this next piece is describing uh, what I did uh, with, uh, with one other guy at the place I used to work, which was trainline.com. So this is not work that I've been doing recently, but this was about, uh, about a year ago, actually, um, when I was a permanent employee here. And though we had some apps which uh, used to provide uh, train times, and they used to appear kind of in, in stations and stuff like this. Um, the challenges we had at the time were, uh, I kind of referred to this already, there was limited 
Git or version control <laughs> skills in the, in, let's call it the service team. It was, it was basically the people who were expected to, to deploy the code onto the live servers. They were really not familiar with version, even version control at all, never mind Git. Um, all the deployments were manual at that point. And when I say manual, I mean somebody would literally zip up a directory of, this was .NET, so a directory of you know, assemblies and everything else, and zip it and send it by email to somebody else, one of the release team, and then they would deploy it onto the server. Right? I should say this, this was not the core part of the train line platform. This is the, this is the non-core. We didn't have any of the main booking flow going through there, uh, which is partly explains why uh, the code and the processes have been kind of left to fall into this state because it wasn't seen as quite so important. But anyway, that's the situation we're in. The production servers were um, snowflakes, snowflake being they're all unique. No one knows how to rebuild them. Um, and if anything, anything went wrong, it would lead to very, be very difficult to diagnose what was happening. There was no continuous integration at all across these um, products. And there was a perception of risk that it was, it was, it was going to be very difficult to automate or risky to automate. And there's uh, if we did anything with kind of deployment pipelines, we'd be touching the live servers directly and all this kind of stuff. Um, so we realized we needed to take an approach which, in order for us to succeed and to have continuous delivery with this relatively small um, uh, set of applications, it wasn't just a technical problem. We had to, we had to address it, um, address some of the other challenges here too. We built um, what Jez Humble and David Farley called uh, call it a walking skeleton. So this is using ThoughtWorks Go, which, sorry, this is my second tool recommendation of the night. Actually, I, I forgot I had this one. If you need to build a demonstration deployment pipeline very rapidly and to convince people, use ThoughtWorks Go, because as far as I'm aware, there's nothing else which does it as quickly. Maybe some of the Cloud B stuff uh, does that now, I'm not sure, but uh, certainly from my experience, uh, nothing comes close. And what we did, um, is to map it out end-to-end, -end, even if some of the stages were manual, even if some of the stages were basically, uh, it, it relied on a, on, a, on, a, on a QA person to go and manually verify parts of the application. That's not a problem. The crucial thing is we're surfacing it, making it available to people, and we also modeled the different um, roles that existed at the time. So we had people as a developer, people, someone as a QA, the QA had to sign off on that application in an environment. And then we had uh, some of the release people who had to sign off before it, get, before it got deployed. And so we modeled that stuff using the role-based security in here. And what that did is it um, gave everyone confidence that they still had control, that they weren't losing control by this thing being automated. They could see what was happening. Everyone had the same view of the world. We could communicate it out to the business people as well. And um, what that meant was because everyone was on board from a very early stage, everyone could get to grips with what we're talking about here. We, we, when we had a conversation with, with security guy and say, well, we've actually solved this stuff, and you can, you can see an audit, you can see exactly who's clicked deploy to production. You can just go to this URL, it's there. So, so your audit of this stuff is super simple. Well, on, on the, what that resulted in is, um, basically everyone, everyone was happy. Because we brought people along, we'd thought about their, uh, their potential worries, where they were in terms of skills or, or their expectations. Um, we could bring everyone along with us by using this tool in a, in a way to bridge a gap between the existing kind of processes and mindset and where we wanted to be. So we didn't just slap in a deployment pipeline and say, right, we're going to go to production now. We used it in a way which allowed people to kind of come with us. A uh, little bit about log aggregation then. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll do, it, do it backwards, actually. So let's imagine that every developer has uh, an instance of, of Logstash or ELK on every Vagrant VM that they're using. And of course, it's then present in all the other environments all the way to production. Contrast that with where you have some fancy monitoring tool which only exists in production. And developers don't know how to use it. So when there's a, a live service incident, then You've got all these developers who know how the software works, but they can't really sit down with ops because they use a different set of tools. I'll talk a bit more about that later. If you're using the same tools in development as in production, then the developer and the ops person can sit down together, and because they're both familiar with it, because the developer actually starts, and I've seen this uh, myself, developers uses something like Logstash to diagnose their own application rather than going directly onto the, onto the logs on disk. They just spin up the local, you know, local host instance of Logstash and use that to, uh, as they're debugging the application. 
So suddenly you've got, you're using the tools and you're, you're enabling a certain kind of collaboration which just can't happen if you don't have, if, it's, if, the, if that particular tool in, is not available in development and, and in the production environments. So you kind of, yes, you're still using something like Logstash as log aggregation and search and so on. And obviously its primary purpose in production is diagnostics and, and trending and that kind of thing. But you're seeing a different way to use that tool, which is A, give the developers um, a more useful way of debugging their application, but also you're seeing that as an ability to bring together two disparate groups of people through, through the tool. Uh, so, yeah. So just to summarize that part, we need to value collaboration as a key criterion when we're choosing tools. And the collaboration aspect is probably orthogonal or at an angle to the main purpose of the tool, but it's incredibly valuable to include it. So we can ask this question, how does the use of this tool, how does a particular use of this tool enable collaboration? If it doesn't enable collaboration, are we thinking about using this tool in the right way? This is uh, a hill in the Lake District in the northwest of England called Helvellyn. It's about 900 meters tall. It looks quite scary for someone who's never done any walking before. Uh, it probably looks quite scary for a lot of people in the UK who have done walking before. It's got a very, sh that's, that's called striding edge. It looks very, very sharp. And in the summertime, it's kind of scary. There's a big drop. But in the wintertime, it's really lethal. Um, so a lot of people would, would, would find climbing up there a little bit, a little bit hairy, right? Um, this is a mountain in the Alps called Weissmies, and it's 4,017 meters tall. And that's me at the top of it. And um, I'm able to be there because as it happens, we had the best weather that, that, that there'd been in that part of the Alps for about 10 years. I was with two people, one of them who's very, very experienced. He's kind of one of the most experienced climbers in the UK. Um, and it's him who took the picture. Um, there's no way I would have been there if he hadn't been there too. It just, it just wouldn't have happened. My point about this is we've got a learning mountain to climb when we're thinking about DevOps and continuous delivery. It's a huge hill to climb for a lot of people, for everyone really, but particularly those people who are actually starting from quite a low point. If we expect them to head up to this crazy mountain like this from the beginning, they're not gonna come with us. They're gonna fall behind or there'll be some sort of accident, if you like. So we need to think about the way in which we can use tools to kind of uh, train people to get better. So we might start with uh, introducing people to a browser-based version of Git, for example. And once they become familiar with that, OK, fine. Hey, do you know if you use a command line version, you can get all this e extra, more rich information out, and you can do grep and blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's really cool. I get it now. So rather than going straight for the command line version of Git, you might choose to go for the browser version instead, because you don't want to try and have to persuade people to climb this massive mountain first. It's too scary. So bring people along with you. Appreciate their current skills, where they are. It's a journey. You need to take people on. Um, if we can get some achievable gains now, we can all feel better, and we can move on to the, the more exciting, bigger stuff later. Uh, I said I'd explain what singleton tools are. So here's a prize bull. This is, this is, there's only one of them. The farmer's only got one of these prize bulls. Got pr you've got two. Oh, two minutes. <laughs> and you've probably come across this, right? It's a special database server, some very costly monitoring system that should remain nameless or whatever. Um, if, if people are thinking about these kind of tools as, oh, we need the best features possible, but we can only afford them in production, then we're, we're, again, we're, we're kind of missing this opportunity to to use those tools as a way to collaborate between developers and operations people. It breaks this feedback loop from production that, we, that, that Gene Kim talks about. Because if, if we've got data that's coming out from production in one format, or that's even not accessible from production for people in development to use if they don't know, know how to use it or can't get access to it, or it's, it's too expensive to get access to it, we're breaking some kind of um, feedback, some information coming back. Uh, Conway's Law, I'm gonna skip. Uh, because we don't have time. Um, but there are, there's, there's quite a lot of buzz online about Conway's Law and how that relates to DevOps right now at the moment. Um, <coughs> if there's, a, there's a URL there. So if you head to bit.ly and slash DevOps topologies, there's something that I've written about this. And it looks like, looks like these kind of diagrams like this, kind of thinking about ways in which 
different organizational structures or teams or things relate together. And the implication of that basically is we need to see the organization as a system. If we've got teams that need to work together, they should probably have the same tools. If we've got teams that actually logically are really quite separate, like an infrastructure as a service team, which is completely separate from your for development teams, then perhaps it's fine for them to use different tools, or perhaps you deliberately want to give them different tools so they don't, you, you don't have some sort of bleed of information between them. But if you're not familiar with Commerce Law, go and, go and read up on that because it's, uh, it has a very strong effect on how uh, we build products in organizations. There's also a video. If you have a look at our Vimeo channel, look, search for London CD on Vimeo. Alan Kelly, who is the, basically the um, Conway's Law guy, uh, one of them at least, he gave a good talk earlier this year uh, on how Conway's Law relates to continuous delivery. So that's worth watching. So then, how to choose tools for DevOps and continuous delivery. Value the col collaboration aspects of the tools, which are kind of orthogonal, cross-cutting to the main uh, properties of the tools. We need to avoid this massive learning mountain. So bring people along with you. You might have a, an evolution of tools over a period of time. I think we should avoid production-only tools because it breaks a whole load of learning and feedback and collaboration between dev and ops or between different groups of people. And um, consider how Conway's law relates to choice of tools and, and the way in which the teams interact. Obviously, there's more stuff we can talk about here, but that, that'll do for now. Uh, there was a slide early on from Nathan that said build quality in. I'm actually writing a, or co-authoring a book called Build Quality In, and I can see one, how many authors here today? We've got at least one author, Mark, uh, or contributor, um, who, who's, who's writing for that as well. That's coming out in September. So that's experience reports of continuous delivery and DevOps. That's it. Thanks very much.